Hey, today I'm excited to bring a new series, or I'll call it a mini-series. I want to talk about the beginning and the end. War production from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. Check it out. Hey, I was just having this cup of coffee and it reminded me, one of our best customers um, actually works at Old Town Donuts. If you live anywhere in the St. Louis area, I'm he I hear he has the best donuts around and they have a website there. So in the St. Louis area, there's a couple locations. This is my second favorite uh, coffee cup and you know what my favorite coffee cup would be, would be that one right there. But anyway, I digress. Uh, let's talk about production of World War II handguns. Uh, we can probably talk about rifles in another episode, another video, but um, let's start with the U.S. Army. So it seems strange to start with the U.S. Army because right away you're thinking there really were not very many production changes, and that's why I'm doing it first. It'll be quick and easy. The bottom line is America was the arsenal for liberty, at least for the Allied armies. They supplied guns to all of the Allies, including Russia, who we didn't have a very good relationship with, but they still did the Lend-Lease uh, program with uh, Russia. No, don't get me wrong, they did a lot of their own production, but we helped them out. Um, but in terms of production, America was never really bombed, and we didn't have shortages. We had plenty of uh, natural resources. So we were able to continue to produce uh, weapons all the way to the end of the war, so much so that we had uh, we had more than enough. At the end of the war, tanks and planes and uh, guns were just being destroyed because we had so many millions. Um, but there was a very tiny uh, changes in production. Basically, uh, the handgun, the sidearm, was the uh, 1911 A1. Uh, most of you are already familiar with that. And the only change you'll notice is this is an early Singer. And you'll say, well, that's not fair, but that's a high polished finish. Well, uh, come check it out over my shoulder. So uh, most of you already know this. Uh, this was, uh, they made 500, these were all high polished finish. And this is, is an unfair comparison because uh, they made them t uh, so well that the US Army said, you know what, we'll have you make aircraft parts. Uh, so they canceled that contract. But let's take a Colt, an early Colt. This one is 1939, notice the finish. Also, you don't see, there's plenty of polish here. Um, you, you'll see on some of the German uh, guns, you can still see the machining lines, but they polished down the metal. They did a nice blued finish. Again, 1939, we have not gotten into the war yet. Uh, of course, uh, 41. And so they made these up until 41, uh, meaning the high polish finish. Get a pretty good idea. Also, they did the wood grip in 39, but then very quickly they switched to the uh, plastic grips. And this is more what you're used to. So you can see side by side. They still polish the guns. They still had the same logo. They still have the same number of features. There's really no production change in the US arsenal other than a parkerized finish. So they went from a blue finish to a parkerized finish. I don't see a huge advantage, but I know it was a lot cheaper and the process was a lot faster. I don't find it to be as durable. Most of the, uh, in the German army, it was uh, phosphate finish. In the American army, they used a parkerized finish. You can see the barrel is blued, which is correct. Um, but this is parkerized. So again, it was cheaper and it was faster. And that's what the United States was all about, getting out a good product as, as quickly as possible. But for the United States equipment, we didn't have the loss of production costs, meaning the quality went down a whole lot. It only, they only made some slight changes. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, Third Reich weapons, however. Okay, this is not obviously a German-made pistol. This is the Polish Radom, or Viz, as they call it in Poland and most of Europe. It would be the Viz. Uh, in the United States, we call it a Polish Radom. This is actually a dust blue, and this is 1939. You can see that this is Polish production. So 1939, the war started up until, they made these up until September. Um, and this is like a dust blue, and the reason I remember that is the finish looks a little dusty. Uh, compared to the rust blue, notice the difference. So in 1939, the Germans occupied the factory, and by 1940, they're putting out their own product. Now let's just take a look at um, let's just take a look at the production quality. You see, it has the three levers, 
there's three lever levers, which includes a safety, an extra safety feature, and then the slide stop. You can see they have the plastic uh, grips. Everything's the same, but the Germans did prefer this blue for some reason. They have a stock, even though they almost never use the stock. You never really see pictures or production of the stocks, but they still use, uh, they still put a stock lug in. And by the way, uh, they did that with the uh, stock lug on the German Luger. Uh, also see the lanyard loop at the bottom. Don't know why they left that there because you never see them actually using a lanyard loop <laughs> uh, or a lanyard uh, attached to their belt. So uh, those were some production features. Also the amount of polish. Uh, well, let's take a look at the late war. This is actually 1944. Here's a picture of one from 1945. The downgrade in the quality of the radium is pretty stark because uh, most of the weapons that were then made on the Eastern Front, and so Poland being in the Eastern Front, and then also the Steyr factory, uh, the, the Russians were coming in a lot more quickly. They needed, uh, they needed more weapons. They rushed them through pretty quickly. And so weapons made on the Eastern Front, uh, you'll see the uh, quality of production went downhill really quickly. So I wanted to show the, uh, the lines, the ma machining lines. Take a look right here, and you can see the machining lines compared to here where they polished it down uh, a, a lot more. And then, of course, this is a phosphated finish. You still see some blued parts. This part uh, is blued. And then on the other side, you see some blued parts. But look at the machining mark. Look at the machining marks through here. You can see the, the, the ridges. Actually, you see stripes, almost like a zebra, all through here, compared to this gun, which the metal was polished down. Again, that just takes time, costs more money. The phosphate finish, I, I find, did not hold up as well, but I know it took less time and it cost less. So the Germans, you'll see throughout production of um, third, third Reich weapons, you'll find the production and the, uh, the use of phosph phosphated finish really increased as the war went on. So 44, and then there's a picture of one from 45. They used the wooden grip. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the grips that were plastic or Bakelite, uh, they later were running low on those supplies. And so uh, a lot of the guns, you'll see, they used wooden grips at the end. However, you'll also see that in some cases where they had wooden grips, they went to Bakelite at the end. So it's all very confusing. <laughs> and that's why it's interesting to talk about. So those are the, those are the production changes. Oh, I didn't mention, notice they got rid of the stock lug but they held on to the lanyard loop. I have no idea why. Never saw anyone use one, nor have I seen a lanyard for a Viz or Radom. I should flip this over because I forgot to talk about the th three lever. So they went from the three lever, the biggest production change um, of, besides the machining of, and the finish was they, they removed that extra safety lever. So they just didn't bother putting it in and you can see the holes where it was, the frame was drilled but they just capped it off and never installed. In 1944 and 1945, they no longer used the three lever. They went to the two lever, which seemed to work perfectly fine. Okay, here's, uh, you can see the finish changes. These are beautiful guns, by the way, which is probably not fair. Most of the ones you see are pretty, pretty worn and these get really dirty. But this is the low grip screw, which is actually only the first few hundred had the low grip screw. And they changed that almost immediately. Uh, these are in, from 1940. Uh, they put it in the middle just because the uh, grip screw down here, uh, it seemed to not be as strong and was subject to breaking or cracking. So they moved it up to the middle. Not a big deal, but the other production change, the logo does change. You see the logo here is pretty light. You could see that this is a high polish uh, blued finish. Look at that. Beautiful. Grip straps, this is actually really beautiful. Started at 700,000 and you see this is 701. So actually they made uh, at least uh, 1,500 or 2,000 of the low grip screw uh, before they moved it. But um, take a look at here. Again, lanyard, remember my advice uh, to the Viz, to the Radom? Get rid of the lanyard, nobody uses it. Here they have a lanyard loop at the bottom and here they removed it from the frame. So that shows the production difference. Also, you see the finish. You can see some machining marks here. 
This is in the middle of the war. No machining marks, it's all polished. The bottom of the magazine, you see this is high polished, but it also has the uh, logo, the Mauser logo, whereas later they said, if these are going off to war, why the heck do we need our logo on it? So they removed that. Again, just it saves a little time and a little bit of money. And then finally, this is ironic, uh, wood grips. We see uh, some of the plastic grips go to wood. In this case, the wood grips, they were running low on the wood grips. And so at the very end of the war, uh, notice the logo has changed quite a bit. See the three-line logo? This logo has changed quite a bit. And this is in the 900, almost 950,000 range, which means it's one of the last ones made. Uh, the, the finish is still beautiful, but it is a, is a dull, uh, it's a duller military finish. Notice the straps, you can see the difference quite obviously. So from uh, 700,000 to about 950,000, the bottom is a little bit different. What they call that the half moon uh, magazine bottom for obvious reasons. And there's the back notice, the change in production. Um, and also the machining lines here. But that's the uh, Mauser HSC made from about 1940 up until 1945. This is a real obvious one. Um, before I have you come in closer, I wanted to make another point about um, early to late, to the beginning and end. As a collector, production was lower in the beginning and therefore these are usually better quality and more expensive to collectors. So people like, oh, I want the, a lot of people say, I want the early high polished ones because they're more beautiful. Uh, they were better made, uh, handcrafted, they spent more time. And therefore the early ones you pay more for. But also the very late war ones, 1945, production goes down again uh, because they're being bombed, they're running out of supplies. And so the beginning and the end are the most expensive. If you're a collector, they go up in value, value. they're more desirable. There's a lot of people who love the beginning and people who love the end. Uh, some people who specialize in just these and not these. Uh, but for me, I, I like to show the contrast. The most common ones are right in the middle. The most common example, we're going to look at P38s uh, next, but the most common example is early P38s with the high polish finish. They go for the most money. And then the very late war AC45s um, that use parts from different factories and they use a lot of phosphate. Uh, those can also be uh, just as expensive, but the P38s in the middle, the run-of-the-mill wartime P38s, they, they stay pretty stable, but the prices are cheaper than the early and late. Uh, come take a look at these two CZ27s. So here's the early one. It's obvious that this is an early high polish finish, and notice how nice the straw, uh, straw color is uh, on the trigger. Uh, and then on the hammer, we'll pull that back so you can see. There's the hammer, there's the trigger. Notice the high polish finish. This uh, commands a premium. Uh, it does have the plastic grip with the logo. You'll notice this has the same plastic grip, but no logo, because at the end of the war, 19, late 44, early 1945, um, no logo, because it's like a, a, just like the Mauser banner, what's the point? Um, this magazine is actually a little corroded. It has the same marking, but in this case, it's a phosphate magazine and somebody highlighted it. In fact, they highlighted all of this and all of this. Not sure if it left a factory like that or if that was added later. Um, you can see the front straps. Notice, the fo again, phosphate finish. Uh, I'll repeat again, I don't find the phosphate or the parkerized finishes to last as long, but they were quicker and cheaper. And so that's why they used them. Notice the straw. This still uses a straw. See the extractor? It's got the straw part. There's a straw part there. Even the grip screws look like they're straw color. I keep saying straw, uh, but it's a straw color. Uh, here is the Waffen stamp. It's a Waffen 76, I believe, Eagle 76. And then there would be a test firing proof eagle there. There's also a Waffen proof on top, usually right here. It's kind of hard to see, but I, I can see it under magnification, or at least my eyes don't see it that well. Very hard to see, but on this phosphated finish, uh, again, still a beautiful gun, but you can see, well, it just is a lot cheaper. Uh, there is a very light uh, Waffen stamp, and then there is a test eagle in the ejection port, and then an eagle on top. It looks like it would go this way. 
there's also a Waffen stamp on top. And so matching serial numbers on the top and on the frame. And then this is also stamped. But this is a, a really good example of um, production of the gun. It, it, certainly the quality is not any, any worse, but it is uh, being banged out a lot faster. Um, there's less polishing of the metal. They just want to get them out there as quickly as possible. You do see a slight change right here and right here. I'm not sure why, that, if that was some kind of improvement, but you do see that the uh, frame, there's a little more pronounced here and, as compared to here, and I'm not sure why, but that's the CZ27. Okay, I mentioned there's probably no better example than the P38 in terms of people love these really late war guns. Um, and compared to this, this beautiful high polish, this, this is an early um, hidden extractor. Extractor is right here, and most of the guns are like that. Again, just like the low grip screw, that didn't last very long because it didn't work as well, so they changed the production on that. Generally, the production did not, meaning the, the mechanics of the gun did not change. This is a very successful uh, design. And by the way, one of the reasons I'm not showing you early and late Lugers is because the Luger stopped production in uh, 1942. So once they stopped production in 1942, uh, Mauser switched over to making P-38s. This is obviously a Walther, made in 1940, so it's one of the first contract guns. Uh, every, every part is Waffen stamped. Every part was inspected and stamped. Um, you can see it here. Uh, takedown lever is stamped under here. You may not even be able to see it, but every part is Waffen stamped and ins uh, individually inspected. So imagine how tedious that would have been. Whereas later, all they did was Waffen stamp the barrel, the frame, and the slide. Uh, so this is um, uh, much later. This is from 1944. It says 43. But the, the large size of that AC tells me that this was made in Belgium at the FN factory and then shipped to the Mauser factory. And this Mauser proof, uh, even though this was, uh, the slide was made in Belgium, notice the, the crude machining marks. Um, the parts are made uh, elsewhere and then shipped to the Mauser factory and that was happening throughout all three factories. Walder was getting parts from elsewhere. Spree work, um, I have a spree work I'll show you next. This is also a phosphated frame with a blued slide and a blued barrel. Notice they're all three different colors. This is called a dual tone, but this is phosphated and this is a dull blue and this is a darker blue. You can see the machining marks. In fact, if you rub your fingers, it, can, it almost feels like a, a, an accordion there. You can feel the, the ribbing on the barrel, just not polished down at all, as opposed to this one is very smooth, uh, smooth as a baby's bottom, as I like to say. But this is just a beautiful gun from 1940. Uh, and again, not much changed. Uh, there's a minor change here. You notice the lanyard is, it, it, well, the grip is different, and the lanyard is rounded. Here it's rectangular, and they went to these grips, which are plastic. They never did go to a wooden grip. Uh, and then here's, uh, here's one from 1945. It's AC45, and you'll notice it's mismatched. Uh, here you see 3048, and then it looks like 3910. Both are in the C block. C block was the last uh, production, probably only has one proof. Normally, it would have three, one, two, three. It went through uh, three inspections at the end of the war. It only got one inspection stamp, was to go out the door. This one was in the factory in April of 1945. The uh, American GIs took over the factory, and um, they either put these together themselves or paid the Polish workers to put them together as souvenirs. You'll notice phosphate, phosphate, no finish. That's no finish. And then bluing. Uh, again, very crude uh, barrel. It's rough. So you see a little bit of everything. You see no finish, you see phosphated finish. There's phosphate there. Sometimes this will be phosphated. Um, so the, f the finishes change, and so early to late. These can, this is mismatched, so that doesn't count. But this is one of the most expensive spree works because it's one of the last ones made. Notice what we call the cog hammer. This is more finely serrated 
And then this is like a cog hammer, which is a lot more crudely made. Uh, this is actually a beautiful gun, hardly anywhere. Uh, but this is made, CYQ is a spree work factory in Czechoslovakia. The Russians, uh, when this was being made, you could hear the Russian artillery shells outside the door. So they were hurrying them along. Um, beautiful gun, but it, it's also very expensive because it's one of the last ones made and they command a premium. U is not a suffix. You see only one proof. Remember I said they just, they just had one inspector hit it and they're done. Uh, you see the U here and here, but it is not a suffix. I believe the U means unhardened, uh, which means they were just rushing the metal out without hardening the metal because they, were, they knew they didn't have much longer. Uh, this looks like it might even be a crack. Notice that? That might even be a crack in the slide, but somebody said, I don't care, just get it out the door, and he approved it. Um, that, that's incredible. Uh, of course, in earlier, or even the year before, they would never let something like that leave the factory, if that indeed is a crack, but it does look like it to me. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up with the Sauer 38H. I still have more to do. I haven't even done the PPs and PPKs. And then, of course, when you get into the Japanese items, talk about crude uh, designs and crude production. Uh, when they were, before the war started, uh, they had problems with guns going off by accident. And so by the end of the war, <laughs> they called them suicide guns for a reason. Um, but uh, we'll get into that. I'll do another video just talking about the beginning and the end. Here is the beginning of the Sauer uh, production. Notice the, the logo, it has the sole and the caliber, and it's just a beautiful high polish finish. There's a lot to admire about that. Uh, whereas this one, you do see machining marks. Uh, the slide uh, it, legend is gone. It just says caliber 7.65. This is a police gun. Um, if you can see that, that's an Eagle F, so that's a police gun. This one was actually issued to the SA, uh, but we won't focus on that. The grips are relatively unchanged, although last week I got a 38H Sauer that had wooden grips um, and they were carved exactly like this. I have no idea if that was done in the factory or post-factory, um, but I hung on to them. I had several phone calls about them. I just don't know, but I'd the only time I've seen wooden Sour grips that looked exactly like the plastic, but they were made of wood. Let's look at the front strap. You can see the difference here. You can see machining here, and you can see how nicely polished it is over here. Um, and then on the other side, uh, they have a, the patent here, and there's nothing, nothing over there. They have a proof mark here and a proof mark here. It's actually a test firing proof. Over here, it is Crown N, and that's just because this was the 38H. The design was from 1938, uh, but this one was probably made in early 39. So um, the Eagle N came out in 1940. This one is from 1939. Uh, the production change they made was they did away with the safety. So they didn't care about your safety. End of the war, they just wanted you to shoot, <laughs> shoot. And if you um, are not careful, you're liable to shoot yourself. Here, they have a safety lever. And by the end of the war, they removed the safety lever. So that's a good example of a production change, which I'm sure saved them quite a bit of money. Notice the machining here. Uh, also, they even painted the sights. They took the time to paint the sights, which I guess helped your aim. And of course, they, they actually did away with that pretty quickly. Um, probably by 1940, they stopped painting the sights because it was just an extra step that nobody needed. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, stay tuned because I have more early and late guns that I want to show you. It should be very educational and you get to see some really cool guns. I wanted to say one other thing about this. I happen to be an entrepreneur in that I started my first business in 1987. Over the years, I started several businesses, including legacy collectibles. I found out that I paid a lot of taxes and employed a lot of people. I think that's really good for America and wherever you're from is a good thing. So my heart goes out to young entrepreneurs that started a business and uh, they're growing it, paying their taxes and employing people. So I'd like to start a new feature on here. If you have some swag, if you're a young entrepreneur or old like me, if you have some swag, you send it to us. We'll do a shout out to your business. Uh, give your website if, if you're okay with that. Send us some swag and we'll put you on a video.